Welcome back to Sparkle on Substack with me, Claire Venus. This is a beautiful September day. I've just dropped my daughter off at school for her very first day at school of the new term and I've got Keris here with me. I'm so excited to speak to Keris. Keris and I have been chatting little bits on Substack but we've never actually met so we're meeting on Zoom today and I'm super, super excited to get into this brilliant conversation around money, sparkling on Substack, strategy, pricing, all that good stuff. Welcome, Keris. Hi. It's Very so nice good to see here. you. Oh, and you're wearing your really sunny yellow as well. You're like, it's yes. like, oh, we're just like in <laughs> Europe, starting the school term. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. September. I love the, the whole getting back to school, new start vibe of September, even though obviously I haven't gone back to school for like 25 years. <laughs> There's something in us, isn't there? There's something in us that kind of gears that we had a really rainy day yesterday. And I was kind of in that sad space of going, is summer over? Like how we're going to manage our energy if the weather's kind of shifts and changes and we've kind of got to get ready in the rain. And then today's been glorious. So I'm so yeah. glad about it. And you're in the UK too, aren't you? Yeah, I am on the Wirral. So Ooh. opposite Liverpool. So Can you hear it I... in your accent? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, it's probably because I moved away. Um, I grew up here and then I moved away when I was 18. I moved to London when I was 18 and then lived all over the place. Well, mostly around Manchester, around the Northwest. And then we just moved back here um, two years ago okay. to be closer to family. And it also, you know, we're by the sea. It's been really lovely. Yeah. But yeah, my kids used to say that they could hear my accent when I talked to my sister on the phone. Mm. But since coming back, yeah, it's definitely creeping back out again. <laughs> And it's I've been so away cool. longer than I lived here, so yeah. And it's so yeah. cool for people listening internationally because what I get a lot is I think my accent is quite strong, and I think there's like obviously going to be a marked difference between our two accents. But for a lot of people, they don't hear the difference, so I just think it's dead interesting, isn't it? But yeah, Keris and I are probably about a four hour, four hour ish drive away, and our accents are quite different. Anyway, I'm tangenting already because I want you to introduce mm -hmm. yourself if that's okay, Keris, and tell everybody about yourself in the world and what you do oh blimey um well I am an author I've been a published author for 14 years this yeah 14 years um this year and I started out writing sort of romantic fiction for teenagers YA rom-coms I guess um and I wrote a few of them for a few years then I had a few adult rom-coms published um then between kind of getting divorced and the pandemic and moving. I haven't really written anything for a while, but I've got two books coming out next year. One is a novel that I can't talk about because it's under a pseudonym and I don't know if I'm allowed to say yet. And the other one is um, my first non-fiction, which is um, called The Harry Styles Effect. And it is sort of like a memoir of fandom. It's um, my... It's about my fandom through the years. The subtitle I wanted was finding myself through fandom. Um, but it's also about kind of Harry Styles in general and his career and his rise to fame and how um, I was just talking to other fans and how he's affected them and how their fandom has affected their lives. You know, it was um, fun. Well, it was fun to write as much fun to write as anything ever is fun to write. <laughs> fun and painful to write oh, I love that though I love that and actually there's something in my peripheral vision because somebody I am connected to on Instagram has written like a fan book about Taylor Swift yeah um I can't it's is it Kat Kat yeah I know oh, her yeah, from oh, when she was a publicist I mean, she might, she's still a publicist doesn't she, is she? she was, yeah yeah I think so yeah I knew her uh, years ago I went to um did she I don't think she came with us I went to Cadbury World with Rainbow Rowell oh. <laughs> and um, Kat, Kat was Rainbow's publicist. Might still be Rainbow's publicist, I don't know. Oh, and, yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's a small, it can be a small world in UK book, book publishing. So yeah. I've learned, you know, there's I've had some really brilliant support on the book um, that I've had out this summer. The Kickstarter is now closed for how to build a world-class substack, but it was great to work with a book publicist on that and to just try to understand how the web of the publicist world in books works I've learned so much and I want to share more about that but it's also a very busy industry isn't it it's like yeah. you know the timelines are quite long and it's quite busy and then there are all of these rules and kind of timelines of weight in which you're in the thick of now I'm super curious to ask you and I know we can't talk about it much but the decision to write under a pseudonym was that your decision or was that something your publisher suggested or how no did that it was the publisher's it was the publisher's suggestion 
Um, and I, I don't, I mean, I didn't even really ask. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, yeah fine, okay. Yeah, cool, cool, um, yeah. <laughs> I think I've just, I had a, I've had a few books out with the same publisher in the past that I think probably, well, definitely from my point of view, didn't do as well as I hoped and mm. presumably also from their point of view. So I think they just thought kind of fresh start, new name. Like, um, yeah, so, why not? It's quite I mean, nice it's in a way, isn't enjoy, it? Like that whole kind of what are we going to dress this up as? Because that yeah. can be quite a fun part of anything. It could be a part of it. I was Substack and remodeling our Substack and rebranding our Substack, but also kind of something getting that fresh energy. I'd never really thought about that before. It's super interesting. Yeah, it's it's um, weird with publishing because you can literally be, be promoted as a debut. Mm. You can have had, you know, 10 books published, come up with a pseudonym and be promoted as a debut, which gives, you know, the kind of new energy to it. So it's all, yeah, it's all, you know, smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Really. yeah and then also it's kind of what people want to buy into isn't it like we've been really surprised with the book like we feel like the book did really well you know but also explaining kickstarter and why it was on kickstarter and then what was happening after that there was a lot of admin involved you know like yeah. just however you do it it's like that big push isn't it to kind of get it out in the world explain what it is and then the why behind it all but obviously once yours your books are out then they're out aren't they and I guess part of your income will come from royalties on those books I'm obviously I'm very naive to all this Karis I'm very new to this world and understanding how it works in real life obviously in theory yeah. I know some of that but for you is there a couple of royalty checks a year is that how it works um that is how it should work <laughs> it hasn't quite worked out that way most of my the, the four adult no the first four of five adult rom-coms were published by booker Chur, who are um like digital first publishers so with those four books i didn't get an advance and it's a higher oh the sun's coming out and i look like i'm fading away oh she's um, there she's not gonna marty mcfly herself it's all good yeah exactly exactly <laughs> that um so yeah with those i didn't get advances but i've actually earned more from those four than any of the others because mm -hmm. it's a higher royalty rate and they've sold really well um the i think there's only two of my other books that have actually earned out one of my young adult books because it they kind of remained it to the works and I had, you know, had probably a hundred pound on top of that. That was a five thousand pound advance for that book. So it's not, you know, it's. I think people think you either get really, really high advances or, you know, royalties, good royalties. But with mine, I've had quite low advances, um, and the royalties are from most of them because most books don't earn out. I mean, mm. that's just a fact that even, um, you know, even with low royalties, you're lucky if books earn out because you have to sell a lot of books to earn back the advance yeah. so for me it's worked out better the digital first books with book have worked out better for me so I'm still the last one came out I think five years ago maybe and I still get quarterly royalties well, which that's is nice brilliant. yeah and I, I mean think... it's not it's hundreds not thousands but yeah um, you know it's still nice to have money come in after all this time yeah. whereas with the traditionally published books you know quite often as soon as the book comes out, it's done. It's over. I remember one book, my agent emailed me and was like, oh, you know, they've, the publishers were apologizing. And I was like, they only came out last week. <laughs> what are they apologizing for? Mm. And they were apologizing because it hadn't got into any water stones. Oh. Um, and so it was dead effectively, immediately, as soon wow. as it came out. Yeah, wow. which was pretty disheartening. And, and so then just help me understand. So obviously it hasn't gone into Watson's and that's fine. But then there's obviously the buying online, say Amazon, obviously. You know, what are Amazon doing like with that then? If that doesn't get picked up by Watson's, does that then affect their decision and how they might print? I don't know, or... to be honest. I mean, that one was a good few years ago now. So and Amazon is changing all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's um, true. Yeah. And, you know, it, I think with that publisher, it was one that wouldn't do... Kindle Unlimited mm -hmm. um they might do now I don't know I haven't looked into it but so it was basically just you know people had to find it themselves and if they didn't they didn't and okay. they didn't <laughs> okay all right yeah no this is all super helpful and then do any of them have audiobooks attached to them do you have that digital yeah, the media sure the book books do and um I think the 
do you know what? I'm absolutely hopeless. I can't. There are, I mean, I have got a lot of books, but I think the the last one did as well. I can't listen to the audio books. I can't. It completely. I just can't bear it. So um, I've is just it your voice reading, reading one it? Of my, yeah, I just can't. Oh, sorry. Is it your voice reading the audio book? Oh no, 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 it's not. It's somebody else's. Got, really but it's just hearing you. I got a lovely yeah. message from a a woman who I follow her on Instagram now, and she actually emailed me and said that she'd just done that. She's a comedian and a voiceover artist, and she'd just done the the audio book for um. It had to be you, I think. No, they changed the names as well. The one who's not the one I think which is the one that changed its name okay. um anyway she messaged me and said that she just finished recording the audiobook and she absolutely loved it and at the end they had to keep pausing the recording because she was crying she's <laughs> cry, like cry laughing or like no, upset. Crying. Like, oh, it's not sad she must cry at happy endings oh. um yeah and it was either the one who's not the one or the one that got away I can't okay. remember what it was, but that oh, was right. really lovely oh that's but, so lovely but then I tried to um and the other one that I think has got an audio book is the, yes, it definitely has the bad mother's book club. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, as soon I can't, I don't read my books back. I can't it's just too cringe. So as soon as I tried to listen to any of the, just the samples online, just, no, I can't bear it. Much. I've really just started difficult. reading a book called star and kitty, which was sort of um, in between. It was kind of teen in between middle grade and young adult. And it came out, I, 10 years ago this year and the rights have reverted to me so I'm going to um republish it myself oh, with like an exciting. anniversary edition mm-hmm. so I've just started I had the the only file that I have isn't the finished file and it didn't come out on Kindle this one mm-hmm. so I ha- I'm having to read the book and listen to word read my final file to make any changes and um, because I'm not I haven't read it since it came out so that's been really interesting I'm really enjoying it so far I don't remember you know I was like I'm reading it as if I'm a reader, not as if I wrote it. That so, is so like, cool. It's actually quite sweet. I'm enjoying mm. this book. Yeah. And it's so true with that process. You know, sometimes people will like quote me on Substack. I'm like, did I say that? <laughs> and, you know, like it's very difficult. Like some things I'm very connected to and other things I'm like, did I? When did I? When did I? Okay. Like yeah. I've said that. So it is really interesting how the craft moves on, but also the way that we connect to our work and disconnect from our work and reconnect to our work moves on that's a super interesting creative process so what's the timeline on that one Kerry? So obviously it's sitting with you isn't it and you make the decision about when you want yeah, to get out that's so what you're thing. thinking if I'd realized sooner that it was 10 years I would have oh, done it well you sooner. can still say that though that's all yeah, right I didn't even it? realize yeah. and then I thought oh it's very late I need I want to put out a 10 year just but I've got you know hopefully once I've read it and made the changes it shouldn't take too long so um I mean definitely before the end of this year mm. that should be coming out and especially since it because it never had a kindle edition it would be nice for it just to have a kindle yeah. and I need to get a new um cover for it and but yeah. it shouldn't in theory it shouldn't take too long to do um, yeah so I'm maybe this, this year it. this year then do you think yeah this year this I year think it's good. my best reviewed book I think um, so loads of good things to say in terms of the PR for the book as well, which is great. And then it, I guess, yeah, getting it out on Substack and Instagram and seeing if anybody wants to buy it. That's very exciting. Yeah. And also traumatising everybody who remembers reading it the first time. And also oh. the, the, like, the teens who read it. And because that's the book that because it's it's a it's about two girls. Um, and so there's you know there was I used to get messages from teens who it was like the first book that they'd ever read about two girls falling in love and um you know they'll be adults now they'll be in their 20s now yeah so yeah, um yeah, yeah. wow yeah. yeah that is really beautiful and it'll be nice to sort of circle back and see what happens with that because you know books can have a profound effect on our life you know the portals into another world and especially with a subject matter like that that's going to be really really insightful to see if those people want to come back and help celebrate with you I'm excited for that and so in terms of where you talk about that because you've got two sub stacks tell us about your two sub stacks that you've got running so I found Keris back when I first started sub stack and it was Ladybird Purse and it took me ages to realize you had a second I think just because of the way we consume sub stack I hadn't quite realized yeah. that so um yeah tell us about them both I'd love to know thanks um yeah the Ladybird Purse was the first one that I set up um and it's about women and money what happened was I got divorced after 
um, 24 years of marriage. And um, I mean, we, you know, I got married fairly young. Well, no, I think now very young, um, 23, I think I was. And so, you know, everything kind of our adult lives were, the, you know, together. So when we split up, I was, you know, having to find somewhere to live and having to pay. And um, it was the, I mean, I, I paid the bills and everything for, you know, when we were married, it wasn't, you know, there's, I've had friends in situations who they didn't know who the mortgage was with. They didn't know, you know, who the electricity company was. I knew all of that. I had, my name was on the accounts, but all, but also, you know, he earned more than me. And so his credit rating was better than mine. And at the time that we split up, a lot of friends were in a similar situation. And in, you know, like I say, in worse situations, because, you know, one friend was in like a um, financially abusive relationship and it just seemed to be very, I mean, I know that it is, um, you know, women in their forties and fifties suddenly being out in the world, <laughs> having to, having all these financial decisions and not having this financial history and not having the earnings history, not having a pension. Um, and I just thought I wanted to talk about it. And I always want to talk about everything. And talk to other women about it. So it started out as being women in midlife in similar situations to me. And then as it's gone on, it's been like two and a half years, I think now, um, I've kind of branched out to just to interviewing any women. Um, and I'm, I'm about to, to start a series that I had an idea that I wanted to interview someone from, a woman from like each decade. So I've spoken to some teenagers, someone in their twenties, thirties, forties, up to eighties so far. I'm hoping to find someone in the 90s who will talk to me about their finances, just because I think it's so interesting through your life, how your relationship to money changes and how your experience with money changes and how, um, you know, already there's been kind of patterns of women not being taken seriously. Um, people assuming that their husband earns the money, that the husband's responsible for the bills, that things like, I mean, it happened to me years ago that I booked a holiday. I booked it all. I arranged it all. I paid for it all. And when it all came through, they put my husband as lead passenger just because he was a man. That kind of thing is still happening. And it's infuriating. Um, so I want to talk about that. And that's been two years now. Um, interviewing somebody every pretty much every week. I think I've missed a couple of weeks. And I just really love doing it. And I know that I get a lot of messages from people people who women who found it really helpful I went on the other day who said that she she knows that it's helped her because she used to feel anxious when she'd get the email and knew that it was about money and now she doesn't feel that anymore she's happy to open it and read it Amazing because she's been that? learning from the, the effect on our nervous system from yeah. going like oh it's something I need to deal with but I'm frightened and I'm scared and they say things I don't understand to go in actually this is really empowering I love that yeah a friend ages ago said that she couldn't subscribe. She was reading it, but she couldn't subscribe because she couldn't have something money related drop into her email when she didn't know it was coming. <laughs> if she just read it herself, she went and read it herself, she could control and prepare herself for it. She didn't want to be kind of surprised by money dropping into her, by something about money dropping into her email. So it's, I just find it completely fascinating. I really love it. And, and you're very, very open. So the format, if anyone hasn't read Keris's Ladybird guest interviews, you'll do a bit of a chatty update, won't you? And you'll tell us a little bit about your week. Like it could be anything from, you know, if you've been on a trip. So <laughs> this week, so I was like delighted by this week. So this week, Keris had been to London and she'd been and found this beautiful chocolate mousse teddy bear. You've really got to see the picture of this thing. Like it's, I mean, I can't so get cute. anything like that in Annick. It's incredible. <laughs> So it's like, yeah, it's a teddy bear. It looks like it's sort of lying down and it's chocolate mousse. And it was, you were telling us about how much it cost, which was 15 pounds. And then your sort of feelings around that and feelings around spending the 15 pounds on the chocolate mousse teddy bear and go into the shop and all thing. And it, I mean, it was beautiful. I was completely transported. And I was also questioning, would I have bought the chocolate mousse teddy bear? You know, that whole thing of like getting into like your own 
sort of yeah your own stuff around money because as much as we can try and work towards it being neutral and us feeling safe it is hard it is hard because yeah. we were constantly having to educate ourselves you know every time the inland revenue email me I'm like oh god you know and it's like I've been self-employed since 2008 like they just send emails it's what they do like they're reminding us to do our tax returns or they're saying have you seen this webinar whatever it's fine so it is I feel like at least a decade long practice for me in leaning into like, okay, like I openly chose to subscribe straight away because I was already open to re-educating myself around money, re-educating myself around the female picture of money and earning and income transparency and leading a little bit with that as well. I'm very passionate. I'm a projector in human design, which I only understood, you know, probably like six months or so ago, but it's meant that I've understood that some of the things I feel called to do are around modeling, you know, just so to be able to say, this is how much money this is brought in. And then for people mm. to lean into that and kind of go, oh, okay. Like, and some of them will be like, oh, well, that's all right for Claire. But others will be like, wow, that's cool for Claire. Maybe I could do that too. And that's what I've definitely learned from my mentor, who I know you know as well, Leonie Dawson. So there's definitely this bit where the re-education is happening very subtly and very gently, like you described with the lady in the email and a really beautiful work of service that you do in those interviews. It's just, I mean, it's just stunning, Keris. It's amazing work. Thank you. It's been really helpful for me as well. I do. I worry sometimes because I think if people have been reading for two years, they'll be thinking she hasn't made much progress. <laughs> she's still oh. she's still got no money. She's still, you know, I mean, I don't really I think the things that I've noticed is, you know, I don't wake up in the night and worry about money anymore, which I used to do often. Um, I am still, you know, not great with money I mean I'm not earning enough is is basically the you know the crux of it so um you know I, somebody quite early on it might have been um Catherine May said it's easy to be it's a lot easier to be good with money when you've got money which is you know I think people forget it's like you know you need to try harder what can I do what can I cut back on what can I and it's like if you if you're not earning enough it doesn't matter if you know what you cut back on it's just not going to be enough but I think for me at the start if I went back and read early early posts I used to worry about spending any money at all I think as I've said in my intro post that I remember posting on a forum online because I literally couldn't spend any money without feeling guilty about it without worrying about it and some random man replied and said, I don't think that's true, is it? I don't think you feel guilty when you fill the car with petrol or when you do a supermarket shop. Yes, I do. When I said everything, I meant everything. I couldn't spend anything. And now I don't feel like that at all. Now I'm fine with, you know, there'll be sometimes a little, you know, I do an order and think, God, that's what it costs, especially now that everything is so much more expensive than you expect it to be. But then there's like the little things like I wrote this week that, I could be happy on a holiday, happily spending, not worrying at all. And then one little thing, I suddenly can't. So in the in the um, post about the Bermus, I also said about, and I went on holiday, went to Mallorca for a few days with my 15 year old last year. And, you know, obviously it wasn't, it wasn't cheap. I'd just had a book advance and it was partly research for the book that I can't talk about. Um, so I was like, well, you know, it was kind of, it was just the two of us. We were having a lovely time. I paid for the hotel, I paid for the flights, paid for everything. And then on the last night, we wanted to go for a meal. And everywhere that I looked, every menu I looked at, I just felt was too expensive. And so after, you know, five days or whatever of spending quite, of being completely relaxed about spending, just that last thing, I couldn't bring myself to do it. And it's that kind of thing that even as relaxed as you feel, sometimes there'll be something... And you need to, or I need to work out where that's coming from and work out what I can do about it and work out when it happens again, because it will, what I can tell myself, you know, it's safe to spend it or, you know, I'm not, it's not, um, cause the, the part of the problem that night was that I felt everything was overpriced and I didn't want to get ripped off, but you know, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Just relax and pay and let it go and now I don't remember what it cost I remember what we ate and I can remember Joe's smiling face opposite me um whereas in the past I would have remembered exactly what it cost and if I had felt short of money I would have been thinking oh we shouldn't have we shouldn't have gone for that meal we shouldn't have spent 
60 quid on that dinner. We shouldn't have, I used to think I shouldn't have bought that magazine, you know, for like three pound 50. Whenever I was short of money, I would feel guilty and worry about all of the, I thought frivolous spending. Whereas now I just think it's all, you know, things that I spend on bring me joy. And so it's worth it. Um, and that actually, just to come back to Harry Styles, <laughs> tangents upon tangents, that st really started with, after me and Mike split up, I went to New York to see Harry Styles live at Madison Square Garden. And I don't know how much I spent. Um, I think, I don't even know why I had money. I can't remember why I had some money. I had some money for once. Went to New York with my friends, went to the concert, just had, was there for like three days, had the absolute best time. And it was the first time I thought, I don't know how much I spent. Uh, it was probably a lot, but it was absolutely 100% worth it. And that seemed to kind of just flick, flick a little switch inside me that's like, I can't put a value on the things that make me so happy. Like how, you know, if I'd written, written it all down, how it's like the old MasterCards adverts, you know? Going to New York with my friends and Harry Styles, priceless. I can't. Priceless, yeah. 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 yeah it's yeah. wild. Kind of, I, it was magic that it was really amazing. Yeah. And I think it's really lovely to hear you speak about these experiences that in life they are, they're just life changing. They're life changing experiences. And it's brave. It is brave to put yourself, okay, like I've had an advance knowing that, yes, it's an advance, say, for example, but then there's going to be a period where there's going to be less money and that's okay. And it's those kind of, you know, we're not living like rock stars, are we, realistically? I still remember sitting down to dinner with my family and not looking at the prices. And it's the first time it's ever happened. And it happened in February this year while we were on holiday. And that is down to the work that I've been doing in the world for sure, but also things like reading your blog, like investing in the work of Leonie Dawson. I just joined this recently as well. This is um, Girls Just Want to Have Impact Funds is the book and it's like female invest mm -hmm. membership. So it's off Substack, but it's a membership. It's like 50 pounds and Kate um, Flanders had mentioned it. And I was like, I'd seen the adverts and stuff. And I was like, I know people have mentioned about investments and I know the younger generation are already doing this work and I still feel completely baffled and completely bamboozled. What can I do? And I was like, I'm going to invest in this £49 membership, read the book, just do the work just gently and slowly and work towards those feelings of freedom because we're doing so much unlearning. Like I see it in your blogs all the time, you know, with the people that you interview, I find them all fascinating, but a lot of the time I'm like, there is so much unrecognized privilege in this person's mm. story. You know, it's not, it's not a judgment. It's not their fault, but I can see it because I'm from a different background and there have been various different struggles with money over the years. And I do think that there's something that, you know, sets your nervous system up to feel safe around money or for it to just be neutral or not a thing or whatever happens and whatever goes on with the push pull of the male and female relationships or however your family's set up that just sets that story and sets that tone for then us going into the world. I think also in the art sector, I've noticed this. So I've just finished, you'd be really interested in this. Actually, I've just finished a survey for a client commissioner about money in the cultural sector in the Northeast. So it's about income, it's about what we spend our money on. There was one question and there's over a hundred replies around, are you VAT registered? Obviously to be VAT registered, you know, we're kind of getting up to, I think it's 90 now, 90,000. Um, the three people out of a hundred that were surveyed. So that survey has gone far and wide, you know, I've captured as many different people within my networks and invested, you know, a good, chunk of my career here and there's three people and you're kind of going oh okay like so that in itself going into that industry you know leaving university there was a ceiling to what it was possible to earn and there was an acceptance of oh you know if a client or a commissioner tells you they've got a daily rate of 120 pounds then you sort of have to accept it because there's a scarcity of where the next gig might be coming from and mm -hmm. as you well know I've shifted all of that and the majority of my work is on Substack now but I felt I had to too, because my nervous system was fried like I was so done with working like that in that kind of feast and famine you know funding bids that felt like a large amount of money but they weren't really like they still weren't enough so yeah, yeah I can really connect with what you're saying yeah that was one well there's a couple of things one is that the biggest um the, I've just actually got a 
I think I've got a slightly better one of the previous, anyway, advance. The biggest advance I got a few years ago was £9,000 for one book. And I was delighted. And I think, I was think, you know, you think of it as nine grand. <laughs> but then the way that it's structured, you know, it's uh, a third. I think it might even have been a quarter, that one. Um, but usually it's a third on signature, a third on delivery of the book, and a third on publication. So a third on signature, great. You know, you lose 20%, 15% to your agent. Agent's about registered, so there's another 20% on top of that. Um, and then the delivery will be maybe a year later. And then if you get the delivery advance, sometimes some publishers are good at paying it straight away, some not so much. And then publication was another year after that. So it worked out at more like two and a half grand a year <laughs> over three years than, well, hey, nine grand. Um, and also you celebrate the advance, you forget that you've still got to write the bloody book as well. Um, but the other thing, and well, the other thing is that when I was growing up, my, well, you, when you said about not looking at the prices, when I was growing up, my first one, my parents were doing quite well. I mean, my, my dad had a good job, a well-paid job. My mom, like a lot of women, had to fit around school. So she was a um, school dinner lady. So she wasn't particularly well paid. Then my dad got made redundant because his job became obsolete. He was a compositor in newspaper and it was all computerized. And he was in his 50s, I think. And, um, and my mum got MS. And after that, they really, really struggled. And so my mum would, it, we used to always laugh at her because she'd go to get the, the shopping and she'd come back and everything had a reduced sticker on it. And she'd be really pleased. She'd be showing us all, you know, this was reduced to 10p and she'd be really pleased with herself. And then I went to stay with a friend and we stayed at his auntie's house and his auntie went to do a do her supermarket shop in M&S, which for a start, doing a supermarket shop in, in M&S is why I wouldn't do that now. It's wild. And as far as I was concerned, she didn't look at the prices at all. She might have been. She might have been glancing at the shelves. But as far as I was concerned, she walked around M&S just putting stuff in her trolley. And it blew my mind. And I was just thinking, that's going to be me. I'm not going to be the one with all of the orange stickers that's going to be me. It wouldn't be me now because that, you know, I know that a full m &S shop would cost four times more than any other shop. And I, I'm much more likely now, I'm much more like my mum that I'll go and get the reductions and I'm really pleased with the reductions. I need to be, I still need to be somewhere in between, I think. I'm clinging too much. I think it just feel like it's really hard to let go of. I, I find it hard to kind of upgrade the idea of, in my mind, like 20 grand a year is a good income, you know, and I was earning that in 1997 when I left London. I find it hard to kind of upgrade what things cost and what people are earning. And it, I feel like I need to kind of rewire it all. Um, and publishing doesn't help, like I said, because the advances haven't changed in the 14 years since I started. In fact, they're lower, I think, mostly they're lower. Um, royalties certainly haven't changed. So it's um, it's tricky. And I'm also reading a novel where he was just talking about his, um, I mean, it's a male writer, it's a female character, talking about her parents' upbringing and, and how that affected their attitude to money. Um, Nick Hornby actually wrote on Substack recently, I think it might even have been his first post when he first joined Substack, about how it's only really just occurred to him how close to the war his childhood was same to me you know I was born in 71 so my parents you know grew up I can remember I can remember my mom, well my mom talking about how poor they were and how you know how they struggled and they took people in um in the summer because it was seaside resort my mom used to sleep in the cupboard under the stairs because they'd rented out her bedroom to holiday makers wow. so I feel like that's something that I need to like you said there's so much you know 10 years I feel like even though I've been looking into it quite deeply <laughs> for quite a long time now the more I read the more I work on it the more stuff comes up that I think oh I hadn't even considered that I hadn't even considered my grandparents I hadn't even considered you know class I hadn't you know there's just so much stuff that um that I need to look into 
there's so much in the unseen isn't there like you say we don't yeah. know like things just once you once you start on your career trajectory you don't then really understand what's going on with adjacent career trajectories and how things shift and change and like I remember um must have been last year I saw a job for Substack and I was like I could do that job it was $160,000 a year and I was like wait I could do that job yeah. I, what like I, honestly I I was saying Dave look like I know we've got Luna and like what do you think I should apply do you think we should do it and he was like just apply like just put yourself through the process you know you've got no idea who, what they're looking for and who they might have lined up already but just put yourself through it and see I really enjoyed writing the application I had a dream that I got the job I didn't get the job I never heard anything from them but then I realized well I already sort of do work for Substack mm -hmm. and now I actually do I have a mentoring role with Substack which I love doing so it's so interesting, isn't it? Like, because I was just so shocked that that amount of money could be paid to somebody. And I'm going to put, you know, inverted commas, like me. Like, I just had never considered that my skill set yeah. could have that worth attached to it yeah. in a salaried role. Never, you know, because yeah. my industry doesn't have that. Like, even CEOs who would be, like, the top of the tree in the cultural sector, they're, like, 50, 60, 65, yeah. maybe, um, thousand pounds. So... It is really exciting to lean in and understand your feelings and emotions, isn't it, as regard to what we earn, but also how we're spending and how that's affecting our nervous system. And I've been quite free this summer holiday. I did a course before the summer and the idea was the money from the course would help me just be more chilled about money. Like it wasn't about not working because I had the book to promote, but it was to be just a little bit more down regulated about it you know if my daughter wanted something and I was doing a supermarket shop rather than going to that whole big and it is big <laughs> set of you know negotiations with yeah. her and trying to distract her with other things I was like okay just get the three pound toy you know I know that it is plastic and I don't want to buy that in terms of like my values of like cluttering up the earth but just to give myself a bit of an easier time, you know? So there are these decisions all the time, aren't they, around what we spend, what we spend it on, like the experiences like the Harry Styles, but then the kind of holding back because we're like, we want to just budget or restrain or get things back in control. Like it's a it's a therapist mm. dream, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm hoping my other plan, you're getting a couple of exclusives actually, because I haven't, about the book starring Kitty, I hadn't written about that yet. And also my plan if it works out, is to do the trauma of money um, oh, training ooh. next year. I didn't even know that was a thing. I should totally do it. Let's sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I've looked at it a few times and um, haven't been able to afford it, mm, obviously. obviously um, and yeah. they do mm -hmm. two, um, I can't remember what they call co cohorts, maybe? They do spring, autumn and spring, and I couldn't do autumn. So, so my plan is that I will sign up and do that in spring with them that the hope that I'll be able to do some sort of money coaching mm, um nice. feel like well, you know, love coach, that, yeah. coach myself first yeah yeah <laughs> and sort then, my own stuff yeah. out and then be like right guys <laughs> rabble dabble, yeah hopefully the, the course yeah. doing the actual course will help me and then I'll yeah. be able to help other people so that's my plan because I kept thinking it's been 14 years since I was first published I'm waiting I'm waiting for something to change you know it's the definition of insanity isn't it it's just I keep thinking yes. the textbook deal could be a big and it could be a big one you know mm. a friend recently got a seven figure book deal so and she's been writing a long time yeah um not as long as me but a long time yeah. so it could happen but it, it doesn't it's, it's a bit like a lottery ones. though isn't it it's a yeah, bit exactly. like living your life like a lottery and actually yeah. we do have more empowerment around money yeah. and bringing income in and you know for me I can send an email and then there'll be money in my bank yeah. account like that's very new you know that's yeah. the last couple of years well pandemic I first started working in that way so we're cracking on aren't we four years but still yeah. you know that is very empowering and also still quite abstract and magical you know so there is something in this space isn't there of taking up space and knowing and trusting ourselves around putting our messages out there you know something in sharing our voice and sharing what we've made in the world being proud of it and being proud to be able to say okay like I've made this I'm proud of it would you like to buy it so yeah yeah I mean I did keep thinking all along I've been thinking I need to do something else but I don't know what else I could do and I'm mm. 53 you know it's very <laughs> unlikely that I'm at all and employable haven't worked in a proper job for 20 years um and then just thought well you know I don't actually have to go and 
find a job I can hopefully create one for myself yeah Mm. and all along I've been saying and people have been saying to me Lady Bird Purse should be a book but then that's the same issue again as with all of the other books you know I might get an advance might not it might sell it might not at least if it's something if I do this course um it's something that's within my control so that's the plan and I mean it could it could be a book but at the same time it's like you don't necessarily have to pitch for that like they'll just come to you won't they and like you can kind of see what happens over the years there's always going to be women that are going to want to write for the substack and that's where we need to circle to because you do have (laughs) this wonderful substack and people can pay for it right so can you set that up for us how does that work so you've got your monthlies you've got your annual you've got your founding member for ladybird and then uh some posts paywalled and some are free reads how do you work all of that out and i know we hit substack bestseller around the time at the same time that was like last october wasn't it so october 2023 do you have other ambitions with the money of your substack and how you want that to work or you just kind of going with the flow chipping away seeing what happens I am kind of just going with the flow um yeah it's I put it it's I think it's I started it at five pound a month and then after a year on the anniversary I put it up to six so it is currently six pound a month 40 a year and 75 founding member which I should know but I don't know um and I do two posts a week, most weeks, the Monday post, which is me talking about my own finances and then the interview, they are always going to be free. I said at the start that it was always going to be free. So then when I basically wanted to make some money from it, I had kind of a bit of a, but I said it was always going to be free, um, which few people told me off about. <laughs> But so instead of paywalling them, instead of paywalling the part I said would always be free, I've added, I added a second um, post, which used to be on Thursday, but now it's on Wednesday. And I most often will go back to an interviewee and get them to follow up on their original interview and say what's changed, which I think some of them, I mean, they've all been interesting, but some of them have been really fascinating. Lots of big changes in two years for people as well. Um, so I actually love doing those follow-ups. I had some kind of expert, some expert interviews, spoke to people. Somebody emailed me and asked about pensions and I spoke to a pension expert. And so I've had some of the um, expert interviews and expert posts as well. And now this week, tomorrow, I'm starting a book club um, with a book. So I keep getting the title wrong. I think it's called The Financial Anxiety Solution. Um, and so we're just going to do a, a chapter a week and kind of work through that um, together, hopefully me working through it um, and posting kind of questions and hopefully we'll have a, a good conversation in the comments. So I haven't done a, I haven't done a book club before because um, I've read so I do read. I try to I read lots of books at the same time and I try to always be reading a money book. But often I just don't really get much out of them. It's stuff that I already know. It's stuff that I just don't find helpful. Mm. Um, Actually, I meant to come back to when you said about investing. I remember reading ages ago that the majority of financial information directed at men is about investing and maximizing income. And the financial articles, et cetera, aimed at women are about budgeting and saving. So I just found that really interesting when I read that. I thought, well, doesn't that just say a lot um and it's frustrating as well isn't it because you know we also want to empower our families for all sorts of reasons you know it's frustrating to feel like we've got to be boxed in and con yeah I mean I did follow a couple of Instagram accounts that were like frugal living type things and I was like yeah it was just it was really getting in my brain like there was one where there was like an envelope thing that she did oh yeah and I was like that's a big TikTok trend is it And and I just was like I don't feel this is helping me be expansive with money. Like I just don't. And I think that is, you've just hit the nail on the head. I understand now I need more education and more modeling and less budgeting. And look, I'm really chuffed because this week I've put like three P in the mortgage. Like, yeah, anyway, (laughs) it's It's um, a lot. My memory is terrible. What's the name of Dana Miranda? She Mm -hmm. is on Substack. Um, Her Substack's called Healthy Rich. And oh, she's yeah. got a book coming out, I think, in December called You Don't Need a Budget. And she is really, I mean, I love her substack. She's um, 
she really helped me think about money in a different way and think about budgeting. Um, I mean, I try not to talk about diet culture, but kind of budget culture is very similar to diet mm, culture. With the same. I honestly hadn't even realised till we just spoke about it then, all of those yeah. influences on budgeting and how to budget and all of that sort of stuff. It's, it's the same there, as like it? restriction and punishment. Mm, and, yeah, know, yeah. There's, lo- there's lots of parallels. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was, that was really, um, I've got, a, I got a couple of interviews with her on Lady Bird Purse and I just found her absolutely fascinating. And- oh, we'll, we'll link to those, Carrie, so people can find it. I feel like actually there's probably a job and I don't know whether you would want to do this or somebody might, but just compiling some more articles and more sub stacks around where people are kind of doing these series about money and all that sort of stuff, because there's some really good stuff. I know, um, I mentioned Kate Flanders already, but she did a little bit of a pivot into talking about some money stuff and talked about the cost of moving to the UK from Canada. And it was like super, just super, super interesting, isn't it? Um, Back to your Substack and then the income generation from Substack. So obviously what we're doing on Substack is we're telling people about our work. So you can tell your people about your books. That can definitely happen. And that might influence some sales and later on, later on down the line, some royalties. But we have the opportunity every time we publish to say to somebody, would you like to upgrade to paid? And you also have another thing where you'll say, if you don't want to upgrade to a subscription, you can buy me a coffee through like the coffee um little setup thing that you can do how how does that feel like when you you know write that sentence and invite those people in to upgrade to pay like do you feel yeah how do you feel about that um it's funny because I've always felt like I should be getting paid for everything I write online you know even back to Twitter I used to, I'd have like 6,000 Twitter followers. And I used to think if you all just paid like one pound, mm. you know, that'd be great. <laughs> if you like my tweets, if you enjoy my tweets, if something's made you laugh, just, you know, give me a pound. Um, and so with Substack, I just feel like I don't ever really want to do a hard sell. I have done a couple of times. I can kind of, I was um, struggling for money earlier this year and I was kind of, I did a subset post that was just like, look, if you read this and you enjoy it, it would really help me out if you would upgrade. And I still feel a little bit, I still feel a little bit weird about it, but I'm leaning more to the side of, you know, it it feels good to support somebody, I think. I feel good about the, the subsets that I pay for. I feel good when I read a post and I buy somebody a coffee. You know, I think... We're all very, we've all very invested in um, not paying people for their writing. You know, it's been a long time that we've got used to that. You know, I used to, when I used to blog, I used to, I mean, I you had so many blogs and I blogged for so long and I was like a paid blogger for a while, but it was like five pound a post. And, hmm. You know, I always thought people should be paying for this. Hmm. Um, so now I am definitely, you know, I'm definitely accepting of it I'm not fully I'm not fully there um but I I do think it's an amazing thing I'm so glad that Substack became the thing you know when I was on Blogger 20 years ago and then I was on Typepad and then I was on WordPress this is what I wanted I just wanted people to pay and mm-hmm. back then it was people like Deuce who put loads of adverts up or you'd get sponsorship or you'd you know people were getting paid people were making a a lot of money but I never I never did Mm -hmm. so this is kind of amazing and it is amazing to to have the money coming in every week um and actually it was really exciting when I used to have kind of to get paid instantly because I was always short of money when I could change it to weekly (laughs) you know so it's like now it's not like three pound a day three pound here and there that I need Mm -hmm. You know, maybe one day I'll be able to change it to monthly. That would be really exciting. Yeah. Um, I think the whole thing, the whole, I would like, I've got like 147, I think, paid subs. I would like a lot more. I would like to, for Substack to be my main income and not have to, I mean, I would still write books, but not, you know, the, the money from books is so erratic anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I you know, I think it's good value. I think I'd provide something, you know, worthwhile 
but obviously there's so many sub stacks now people can't pay for everything so I completely understand that as well yeah but it's like it, there's so much nuance in us as readers and what we decide to pay for and whose work we decide to pay for and there's been I mean even that in itself my journey of who I've paid for and I always go annual so like I should probably look at that because I'm probably paying for far too many now but I've done it you know I've made that decision and I've invested in that person for a year and then when I've been invited in for a second year that's been it's Mm. been heavy I've been like god I don't know like I've paid for a year and I don't know and thinking about that value piece and I do think it's interesting that you mentioned okay so I said it was all going to be free and I've changed my mind because it's our right to do that right Mm. like as creators we don't know what we're doing on Substack when we come on to Substack we don't know what the possibility is what the potential is you know we've written for free or we've done we've done work in the world for free open access whatever you want to call it And if we change our minds, obviously, yes, there might be resistance to that. But then if we're taking care of ourselves in that and going, there's still all of this stuff, you know, there's all of this stuff for free in the archives. You couldn't even get Mm. through it all in, you know, three months if you tried. And now I'm setting this up and it's different. So some people have gone, you know, 100 percent paywall on their on their publications. And I love it. I'm like, good. I need more of that. I need to see more of that, because while we're in this dance where it's like, okay, like this is all my free content. We're driving free subscribers, which is great. We might want to drive free readers for subscribers. People might give us our their attention and that's all perfect. But I know for my publications, when I'm looking at the conversion between free readers and pay, paid readers, people need a nudge, right? So if you're mm-hmm. just going to keep giving them all the lovely stuff, they're not going to pay. You know, the, maybe now and again, someone might be like, I really love what you're doing. Here's some money. But not, yeah. you know, we're not a charity. We're not setting yeah. ourselves up that way. So we have to then set out our stall and say, this is the value you get and treat that paid community in a different way than we treat what we're putting out for free. So whether that free content is an act of service, whether it's to try and convert people, like getting really clear on that. But when I've been doing this work and when I've been realizing this is how we have to do it, that's when Substack becomes a business in itself. Mm -hmm. And that's where you, you know, when you read, there's a lot of people obviously who've been able to to drive a lot of subscriptions and a lot of paid subscriptions and got book deals off the back of it and all sorts of glorious stuff. Everything's possible, but we have to set it up in a way that people understand, okay, this is what I'm doing and why. And then the people who, I guess this is the last point on it, the people who want to complain, like I had one this morning, a guy emailed me and said, I will absolutely never pay for your work. It's like, okay, well, you know, I never asked um, you Mm -hmm. specifically. It was a sales email, right? It was like diamond Mm -hmm. memberships closing. This is the last time to get in. That was that one. And I just, this is sort of the second or the third strange email he sent me. I just went on there. I unsubscribed him. I blocked him. So he'll not be able to subscribe now. And I just feel so much better. It's like, I do not need you telling me that you'll never pay for my work because I'm not trying to sell to you. Like if you've ended Mm -hmm. up here for a free ride, it's finished get off I'll see you later and I think now I feel so much better about being able to do that a year ago I would have just cried in my kitchen and my husband Mm. would have been like as someone died and I'd be like no it's my work oh god like I get so dramatic because it's like it feels so personal it feels so real it feels so intrusive and I'm in my home and it's like but on the flip side I get to show up with all these wonderful people in a really safe space and a really beautiful community and I feel like you do that so well as well Carissa so I, I know I'm like trying to sort of like preach here, but I do think there is a bit where people might would just want to complain a little bit and we just let them have it and then we move on and we're in our mm-hmm. space where it feels like these are the people that really want to support me. Or oh, Dave's from your cup of tea. Thanks. I'm nearly <laughs> up. Oh, he needs nice. he needs the studio. So I'm just I told you about tangents. Um but I did want to just jump into um your second substack, just so people know that you've got the two and what the other one does quickly before we finish, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I just wanted to say as well quickly about Ladybird Purse. One of the reasons I wanted to keep the Mondays free is because a lot of the value of it is for people who wouldn't be able to afford to pay it. Yeah, so I don't want to sure. block, you know, I don't want to cut off people who couldn't afford it. Yeah. Um, but I do say if anybody wants to email me, um, they can have a comp subscription, which, you know, probably one a month 
And it's I actually lovely. really love getting those emails. Yeah, I love me too. It's me like too. my happiest thing when people ask. I'm always I want to reply like, you know, so glad you asked. Yeah, <laughs> um, same, it's really, same. Yeah. It's really beautiful to be able to do that work and also to say it's no questions asked, you know, because yeah. it is, it's, it's fine. Of People course, often come on in. The yeah. email, you know, it's because yeah. of this, 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 it's like, it's fine. You know, Just it's come fine. on in. Yeah. Um, also, I had some dodgy emails from a mail reader recently. So after this, I'll need to check with you if it's the same person, but <laughs> I bet it is. Um, <laughs> the other, my other one is I moved my author newsletter over to Substack after I think a year of doing the Ladybird Press just because I love the whole setup of Substack and it's just so easy to write on Substack. So my other one is called Happy Endings, um, which was the title of the book I was writing at the time and then it got changed, but I love it, I love it as a title for my newsletter. So um, it is really, once again, it's one free post and one paid. And the free one is just me kind of writing about what I've been reading, what I've been doing, what I've been watching on TV, what I've been cooking, just like a general update. And then the Saturday post, when I am working on something, which I haven't been over the summer, um, I write about, I, I usually, my favourite thing to do is to keep a diary each day of what I've written and like word count and like research. Um, and then to post part of you know a snippet a you know a scene even a chapter sometimes of of whatever I'm writing um for paid subscribers and also as part of that which which um is a what's it called another section under that one is I have um I haven't posted anything there yet but it's called mum's suitcase um my mum died 25 years ago and then when my dad died in 2010, my sister found like a little battered old suitcase in the loft full of kind of stuff that my mum had saved since the 50s. Programmes from theatre shows and postcards and photos and even like a little squashed Easter chick and letters. And she lived in America for a year in 1963. Um, and so there's you know, she went to the Copacabana in New York and she went to the New York World's Fair and she kept everything. She's kept receipts. She's kept like dry cleaning receipts. She's kept everything in there. Um, and then she and my dad emigrated to Canada in 66, which is where I was born. And then they came back when I was four months old. So there's stuff, there's stuff in there related to Canada as well. So when we found it, I kind of went through it all, scanning things in and there's a little diary in there as well. And um I did I did a blog at the time and I that was one of the things that I always thought this blog should be much more popular than it is <laughs> and this blog should be a book and then just kind of didn't do anything with it for years so then when I thought well Substack that seems to be the place where maybe this time it will actually you know I'm not literally just doing it to maybe get a book out of it I want to I just think it's really interesting. So instead of just scanning it in and, and writing, I want to um, kind of do some research around it. It's it's relevant to the novel that I'm writing as well. So it's kind of novel research at the same time. So yeah, so in Happy Endings, there's like general author stuff, extracts from works in progress. And soon there will also be stuff from my mum's suitcase and, uh, you know, research around that. I love that. It's just, it's such a lovely, like, Sunday afternoon. I'm going to get a cup of tea. I'm going to read a little bit more of the update of Carissa's mum's suitcase. It's fascinating. I love all that stuff. And I think because we are going so and have gone so digital, like, I haven't even yet got, like, you know, people buzz their phone to pay for things. Like, I just can't do it. I'm like, I need, I need the card. <laughs> so because everything's moving digital, those receipts and those tickets, they are somehow they're becoming more precious, aren't they? They're becoming mm. more nostalgic to us. And there's something in that kind of scrapbooking nature or us making decisions around what might be important to keep for our kids or keep for ourselves, you know, to frame up or whatever. I love all that stuff. I think it's yeah. really lovely as well with the, the, you know, the circling back to the theme and the Harry Styles book, right? Because there's obviously something in your lineage there where it's like, this is precious. This is a precious memory, like similar with the yeah, Harry Styles and, stuff. Well, also, that was one of the things that came up so many times when I was writing the Harry book that I was like, oh, I haven't connected. My mum was obsessed with John Lennon. Um, you know, when my mum, um, when my mum's mum died young, my mum went to America to work as a nanny for a year. And 
while she was there, it was like 63. So that was when the, that was the Beatles. She used to go to the cavern to dance in her lunch hour in Liverpool, mm-hmm. but 63. So that was when the Beatles were huge in America and because she was homesick and she was grieving, you know, that was when she became obsessed with the Beatles. I got obsessed with One Direction, despite, you know, being twice their age, when my marriage was ending. It was like, you know, bringing you back to something that you loved and that you were excited about that made you feel alive when you were a teenager to get those feelings back again in your 40s. It's a thing. It's definitely a thing. But I hadn't until I was writing the book, I hadn't connected. Oh, my mum had the same or similar yeah. experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I found it so interesting the way she writes about money as well. You know, the apple did not fall far from the tree. Mm-hmm. There's a letter that I found recently where she bought a she found some shoes on sale in New York and they were something ridiculous, like, you know, two dollars. And she bought nine pairs and she wrote like a whole paragraph about how excited she was. Nine pairs of shoes. Nine pairs of shoes. And had written she she really liked them. They and were maybe like, it was just because they were a bargain. Maybe it was yeah, both. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. She said she she went to look at them to laugh at them. She thought they were going to be crap. And then she found that they were actually really, really nice shoes. And they were like four shillings a pair or something. Oh, that <laughs> so is she bought so nine pairs and just reading this of her raving about these shoes really made me laugh. That and is re- that's posts, really beautiful. Very similar things about how they went to this bar, but the drinks cost this much. And so they got their drinks, but, you know, she bought the drink, but she worried about it and kept thinking about it. And I was like, yeah, this is obviously where... Sounds so really familiar. <laughs> it's re- it's really interesting what you're saying because it reminds me of my father-in-law who we lost a couple of years ago and he had this cupboard of shoes and he was so frugal with everything. Like I'm talking like he would take napkins from wherever we were out and then he'd be like, right, well, I've got them now. And it's like, what do you mean? <laughs> but anyway, and yeah, the cupboard of shoes and he would always be like if we were out and there was like a shoe shop, he would just be amazed at how cheap the shoes were. Mm. So there's something I think generational that yeah shoes were like you got your shoes and then that was it you know you wore them or you got them fixed until they were dropping to bits so yeah. there's definitely something in that isn't there in that lovely kind of freedom it was lovely to see because he was so frugal in all other areas of his life but the shoe cupboard it was like you couldn't not and then a couple of times you know we passed some on that had been too small for Dave or whatever and they were like proper like trendy skater ones that we'd got and he was so chuffed you know he got them on like 86 you know with his little shoes Oh, it was just gorgeous. So that's that's reminded me of that. So thank you for that. Yeah. But I can't wait to read more about it, Keris. It just sounds really, really beautiful. Like oh, lovely, lovely stories. Are. And it's that it's that slow reading bit for me that I get so much from with Substack, like where I can really just get lost in someone's story. And I probably definitely should be picking up a Kindle or a physical book, but mm. um, I don't I often don't. I'm like, oh, which like which ones have I got saved and which ones can I read? There's so much it's it absolutely blows my mind really how much amazing stuff there is on Substack and I'm always thinking I'll you know I'll go on notes I'll read something and I'll be like that is exactly what I needed to read right Mm. now and if I hadn't picked up my phone at this moment I probably would have missed it and that happens all the time that's not even the people that I subscribe to who also just you know there's just so much incredible writing on there Mm. and so many people that I feel kind of like genuinely fond of and I'm really happy when the newsletters pop up I don't know it's just been an absolute revelation it's just the best thing it's really great for building connection as well isn't it and feeling like less alone in this world of how we're trying to navigate it for sure like in terms of the balance of like building a readership but also building a business within that readership and then also like supporting each other as colleagues Mm -hmm. I really feel that and I really feel that in kind of setting out my stall and kind of being quite nervous I remember I've told you this before but when I wrote to you and said could I do an interview I was terrified like that was such a terrifying email to send because that was my first like ask my first pitch I'd never done that before and it just felt really scary and then Mm -hmm. now I'm like all right okay like do a little guest post off we go you know so I think Actually, just, if I said no. I know. I know what would have happened. I wouldn't have a Substack book out, that's for sure. I would have just like sliding doors moments. I know, I don't, this is it. Back to the cultural sector. God. Um yeah, so well, it's You're been so powerful. brilliant to hear about the way that you've set things up for yourself as an author and then your hopes for how things are and how things are going in the future with Substack. And I'd love to invite you back. I think what you do, you know, speaking to people in another little block of time, like a two-year thing, I feel like I can really 
feel that with this podcast as well so we should chat again I feel like we've yeah, got probably other that. things that we want to talk about um yeah. and be nice to do in um, a year or so's time but other than that um you've mentioned it a couple of times but just let people know where they can follow you online if you would um well my author substack is just keris.substack.com the ladybird purse is the ladybird purse.substack thinking it wasn't then but it, no it definitely is i'm on instagram um keris fox and my website is which i also need to update is keris fox that's it i've just changed it because i changed my name i think it's just keris fox we'll link we can link to it i've yet to meet anybody i mean i think i'm the only keris fox so yeah I'm we'll find you be there <laughs> I haven't, i'm yet to meet anybody that doesn't sort of introduce their website with <laughs> i also need to update no <laughs> it's like I feel as well with Substack I've just totally neglected my website like well, I'll be all right you know I just got I've got Substack work to do so yeah no it is, it is on my plan even, do people go on websites but it needs I think to be it's there, for the search to, engine optimization yeah, isn't it yeah. and I think also it's just that it's great for that kind of social proof so if you kind of build yeah. in testimonials in and it's my shop as well I should definitely be a bit more kind and caring with it but it's just not as fun as Substack so yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not as easy to update either I need to find an easier way to update it because it puts me off yeah for but, yeah, sure there. but yeah oh, well, I'm very googleable good well thank you Keris thanks for talking thank to me you. today it was brilliant to connect and I shall see you again really soon lovely thanks bye